uh, as I was preparing uh, this talk, this teaching today, the God, God said, hey, I really need you to not preach this thing. I really need you to teach this thing um, because I feel like, and maybe this is the common consensus or it might just me, but I feel like we live in an angry world. Can I get an amen if you believe that? Uh, uh, some of you are like, I'm mad right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I've, just, I, I've just lived enough life to realize that the day and age that we are living in is just angry. It's just mad. And it's just especially just looking for reasons to be angry and mad. If you turn on the news and watch the news for any amount of time, you will realize, wow, people are really angry. If you drive in traffic long enough, you realize, wow, people are are really angry. If you go to the grocery store, you can realize, wow, people are really angry. And maybe you have experienced some element of that in your life, but for some reason, I just feel like we live in a more angry world than we live in a more joy-filled world. And that's why God spoke to me, and he asked me this question. He's like, hey, bro, you mad? <laughs> Are, are you mad? How is your soul? How are your emotions? How are you in controlling this word that we call anger? Uh, the other day, me and my wife, we were buying flooring for our house, and we went to Floor and Decor, and we purchased all of this stuff, a big pallet worth of flooring and all these other things. And uh, the guy said, hey, take your receipt to the warehouse, people, and uh, at the warehouse, you will be able to retrieve all of your stuff, put it in your vehicle, and go home. So we go to the warehouse, and, and we, oh, the sliding doors open, and we walk up to the counter, and there's a lady across the counter. And I said, hey, ma'am, I am here to pick up my floors. The man said to give you my receipt. Here it is. And she straight up, stone cold face, ignored me. Just kept looking at her computer typing. I'm like, I don't know if you are deaf, if you are ignoring me, or you're just having a bad day. Um, but I asked again, I said, um, excuse me, uh, ma'am, right, you ever had someone do that to you before where they just blatantly ignore you and you're like, I don't even know what to do right now. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know how to respond. So I'm like, hi, ma'am, I'm, I'm here to, to pick up my floors, and she's like, I heard you. And she just keeps typing. <laughs> I, I said, ma'am, um, I'm going to need you to do something. So then, so then she pulls one of these, right? She's just typing. She doesn't say a word. She just goes, right? And she doesn't even look at me. She grabs my receipt, okay? And I'm like, dude, this lady is having a bad day, right? You ever met those people that work at jobs, and you're just like, why do you work here? <laughs> like, like nobody is forcing you to be here right now. It's, it is by choice that you are employed at this establishment. If you hate it that much, just quit. Go work somewhere else, literally anywhere else. And she grabs my receipt and she says, sir, you can't pick it up right now. It's going to be at least 30 minutes. And so I turn to my wife and, and, and I don't do well with conflict. <laughs> okay, I'm not like the type to like snap back. I'm just like the type to like just be quiet. My wife, she's the little chihuahua, okay. And like when I need something, I'm like, babe, you're gonna need to handle this one, right? So me and my wife talk, and we're like, you know what? It's okay. We could we could pick it up, and we're like, we'll, we'll just go to get lunch, and then we'll come back. And so I said, cool, ma'am. I'll, I'll be back in 30 minutes. And she says, uh-uh, no, you won't. You need to come back at 3 p.m. because that's the earliest you can pick it up. It is 12 p.m. right now. You just said 30 minutes, and now you're saying three hours. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. She's angry. She's angry. So we're like, you know what, whatever. Okay. Turns out 30 minutes later, I get a call. Hey, your order's ready for pickup. I'm like, yo, what is this chick on, dude? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So me and my wife, we go back, and the warehouse guy comes to us now. And the warehouse guy says, hey, where's your vehicle? We say right here. He looks at us, and he laughs at us. He's like, ha, that stuff is not fitting in that car. <laughs> you guys are ridiculous, but we'll bring it out to you. And I'm like, dude, what is going on at Floor and Decor? <laughs> like, did they just let half of their staff go and everybody just fearful for their lives, their jobs? And So then we go and it starts bringing it out and we start loading it in the car. And I'm praying to God because I'm like the type that likes to prove people wrong. You know what I'm saying? Anybody else? You're like, oh, it ain't going to fit. I'm going to strap it to the hood. I'm going to put some next to the engine. Uh, my baby's going to be kept. Like, we're going to fit this thing in the car. Okay? So we start piling it in. And so me and my wife, we're like, it, it's clearly going to fit. So me and my wife, like, we're pastors, right? So we got to be careful what we say. But we start talking, right? 
And we're like, me and my wife, we're like talking to each other. We're like, oh, man, dude, I think it's going to fit. Yeah, dude, like, man, wow, this is amazing. Right, we're trying to talk loud enough for him to hear us. I, I wanted so bad to be like, suck it, but I couldn't, right, because I'm sanctified, I'm holy, right. So, so, but I thought it, I thought it. I was just like, man, it's just so funny. People are just so angry, so disgruntled, so upset, so mad, so dismembered in the mind. Have you ever noticed that anger has become, in, especially in our day and age, the default emotion that we feel? When bad things happen or when, or when outcomes occur that we didn't expect, we just get mad. We, 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 just, we, we deal with this thing called anger. Today I want to talk to you about this thing called anger because I feel like the wick of people is getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> you ever talk to your boss, right? And, and all it takes is one, just, just one thing and then snap, it's over. Or maybe you. Maybe someone says something to you, and it's just like, dude, I, I, I just snap. I just get mad. Tap your neighbor and say, you mad, bro? Seriously. I, I, but, hey, are, are you mad, bro? Because in James chapter 1, this is our foundational text today. James chapter 1, verse 19, it says this. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. I love this very simple three-step process that James gives us. Okay? Can I solve most of the problems that you have in your life right now? Okay, permission to give you the antidote to all of the things that you have been wanting and needing in your life. James, he paints the picture so simple. He says, all you got to do is three things. Shut up. <laughs> Open your ears. Don't get angry. Listen fast. Speak slow. Don't get angry. See, I love it because it sounds so simple, but how many of you know that is so hard? <laughs> Especially if you got a loud mouth. Come on, where are my loud mouth people in the room today? Come on, you just got a loud mouth, right? It's, it's a big mouth and it's a loud mouth. All right, that's, that's like one of the syndromes that I struggle with. I got loud mouth syndrome, okay. I just got a loud mouth, and it's funny because my, now my daughters, they adopted my loud mouth. The other day I was like, girlfriend, why are you so loud? My wife was like, she inherited it from you. Because okay? let's be honest, it's easy to talk fast, listen slow, and get angry. But how many know it is hard in our day and age to listen fast, Speak slow and don't get angry. Why is this simple instruction so difficult? Here's why. It's because offense is the bait that Satan uses to take Christians out. Did you know that offense takes out more Christians in the church than anything else? Anything else. Offense, John Bevere says it this way, is the bait of Satan. He wrote a book on this idea of offense, offense, offense. It is the single-handedly the greatest tool that the enemy will use to take you and I out of the place that God has called us. Why? Because we get offended, because we get bitter, because we get mad. Why did the Pharisees struggle with Jesus? Because Jesus offended them. Jesus was offensive to their culture. He was offensive to their ways. Can I tell you something? The gospel is offensive to people that don't want to hear it. It just is. Therefore, if you're going to be a believer, you better get ready for people to get offended. You better get ready if you're going to be a walking billboard for Jesus, just like the Pharisees, to look at you and say, no, 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 I don't like the church. No, 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 I don't like those Christians. No, 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 I don't like what they're preaching. Why? Because it offends culture. It offends lifestyles. It offends habits not to condemn, not to look down upon so that people could be built up, so that people can know what the way looks like, so that people can know the truth and the truth can set them free. But it's offensive. It's offensive. And, and, and here's the thing about offense when not dealt with the right way. Just like the Pharisees, they allowed their offenses to lead to their demise because offense will do three things. What will it do? It will bring disorder. It will bring division. 
and it will bring distance. It will bring disorder, it will bring division, and it will bring distance. You ever have an offense before in your life that just created absolute chaos in your life? You ever have an offense before in your life that, man, it, it was a small offense. It, it was small. But now all of a sudden you are seeing it affect every single area of your life. And, and, and here's how the enemy tricks us to cope with our offenses. Just get mad. Just get angry. Just go punch a wall. <laughs> just, just, just frown. Just, 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 just let it out. Get mad. Be upset. And God's like, bro, we got we to deal with these offenses because in the midst of our madness and our sadness, there is an unraveling of our spirit that leaves us in utter chaos. Chaos, 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 chaos in disorder, in division, and in distance. And we try to crawl and claw our way out of this chasm of destruction. Proverbs 19 says this, good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. You ever heard the phrase, what, what's gotten into you? You ever heard that your mama looked at you and she's like, boy, what has gotten into you? Girl, what has gotten into you? Me and my wife, we were in Hawaii a few weeks ago and we were out surfing. And on this very last wave that my wife caught, she got slammed in this wave and she's rolling around on the beach. And if you're a beach goer, especially surfing on waves and getting tossed in waves and, and, and in like, like a real sandy environment. Here is one thing that you can count on every single time that you go to the beach. One common denominator, there will always be sand everywhere. <laughs> like how many of you, you ever been to the beach before and you know what I'm talking about? Like there is sand everywhere. We used to live in Miami. We used to go to the beach every single day. In our car, there was always sand. We would vacuum it out. There was always sand everywhere. We uh, got, we put our surfboards back and we went and we rinsed off a little bit and, and, and we got in the car and I was like, dang girl, you got sand everywhere. It's still in your hair. It's still in your ears. It's still in your nose. We went home. We took a shower. How many know when you take a shower after you go to the beach, you realize that there is sand traps in places that you didn't even know existed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's in your nose. It's under your eyelids. It's in your belly button. It is everywhere. Right? Scrubbing, trying to get this sand off. It's everywhere. It's funny because a few weeks ago, my wife, she feels something in her ear. And we're in Arizona now. <laughs> we ain't even in Hawaii anymore. And she starts digging in there. She's like, what is this? And she pulls out a bunch of sand in her ear. Because that woman don't shower right. Okay. No, but it's funny because even when... She tried to cleanse, and even when she tried to get rid of it, there was still sand everywhere. Weeks later, she's still finding sand in her ears, still finding sand in places that it doesn't belong. And I'm here to ask you today, what has gotten into you that you haven't done a thorough enough job of getting it out of you? And now, because you let it settle in, it's affecting places that you didn't even think it could. And because you didn't take care of it, it begins to latch on to places that aren't even responsible for the original offense. You ever met somebody like that? That they're just so offended and now they're not even taking it out on the offender. They're just taking it out everywhere. And all of a sudden, a small grain of sand turned into a head full of sand, and you're walking around 10 years later, 20 years later, you, you, you show up in your 40s, and you're like, man, why am I so mad at every single man that comes into my life? And it's because you didn't deal with the offense of your father when he abandoned you, and now you're wondering why at 40, you're like, man, this doesn't make sense, but it's because you didn't get out of you what your father put in you. And now 40 years later, you're digging out sand in your ears. I wonder how many offenses in our lives, even from our childhood, have we carried into in our young adulthood and saying, man, why am I acting like this? Why do I always have a bad attitude? Why am I always angry? Why am I always looking for a reason to yell at somebody and get upset and get disgruntled? Maybe it's because there's some sand still stuck in your, your ears. 
and we start to live this life. We, we do it all the time. We wake up with bad attitudes that ruin our day. We talk to people short-wicked. We roll our eyes at the waiter. We expect other people to cater to us. We, we cut people off in traffic just because I, I need to get to where I'm going. We get angry at the world, not because of the world, but because hurt people hurt people. And today, I just wonder if God wants to say, hey, I need you to lay down your offenses so that I can take you to new levels. I need you to lay down your offenses because you are called, you are chosen, you are set apart. But guess what? Your offenses don't get to come with you. And only until you let down your offenses, only until you stop getting mad, only until you become slow to anger can I really do something in your life. Today I want to deal with some bitterness, some offense, some anger that maybe has been pent up for too long. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. I've got good news for you. You're, you're in the room and you're like, man, I've been dealing with this offense for a long time. Guess what? Today is the day of salvation. God can say, hey, give it to me and you can walk out of here a new person. Let me take you back to the genesis of your anger. Where does it start? Many times the first place that it starts is bitterness. In Hebrews chapter 12 it says this, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up, troubles you, and corrupts many. There are three things that bitterness will do in your life. Number one, Bitterness will show up. <laughs> That's just a promise from the Bible. That, fair warning, bitterness is going to show up. Number two is this, it causes trouble. When you don't deal with bitterness, it always causes trouble. And then number three, what will bitterness do? It will corrupt not just you, it will corrupt many. This is why I want to talk about bitterness today. I want to talk about your offenses. I want to talk about your anger. I want to talk about your attitude. I want to talk about your emotions. Because write this down today. Bitterness is a seed. The Bible calls it the root of bitterness. And, and you have to be careful because it grows. What does this tell me? That bitterness is a seed. The Bible says don't let it grow. Why? Because bitterness will always be available. For as long as you live on this earth. The seeds of bitterness will be sprinkled. There are some of you that walked through the doors of this church today and somebody looked at you the wrong way and you got bitter. You're like, why are they looking at me like that? Why? Like, what? Like, what? 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 Why is that girl sitting in my seat? I sit in that seat every single week. Me and my booty are in a committed relationship with that seat. You look under that seat, my gum is stuck under that seat. Bitter, bitter, bitter. Wait, bitterness. What, 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 it'll show up. It'll always show up. It'll always show up. Maybe that wasn't you. Maybe you had a tough conversation at work. You got corrected. But you thought you were right. You ever been in conversation you're just like, well, excuse me. <laughs> bitter. Bitter. We, we, get, we get bitter. Somebody did something to you. Somebody said something to you. Something happened in your life. And, and, and what happens? It's a seed. It's a seed. And you have to be careful because the problem is not the seed. The problem is how long you allow that seed to sit in the garden of your life. Because any seed that sits in the garden of your life will grow. It doesn't matter if it's a bad seed. It doesn't matter if it's a good seed. If you leave it in the garden of your life, it will grow. Bitterness, what is it? It's a, it's a seed. Even if you don't think that it matters, even if you don't want it, even if you don't think it will grow, if you leave it in your garden long enough, whatever is not meticulously managed will multiply. It, it's, it's promised to. As long as it's in your garden, guess what? It's going to get sprinkled. It's going to experience sunlight, and, and you're going to experience fruit, but maybe it's not the good fruit. Maybe it's the rotten fruit. My wife and I, we, we live in a house. Could you imagine if somebody knocked on my door one day and was like, hey, yo, bro, I need a place to stay. Can I come kick it with you? I know you don't know me. I don't, I don't belong to your family, but they're just knocking on my door, and they're like, yo, 
Is it cool if I come kick it in the crib out? If I come sleep in your bed? If I come eat your food? If I come wear your clothes? If I come use your toilet? Like, yo, if I let that person into my house, I was like, yeah, bro, take whatever you want. Go ahead. You guys would call me crazy. You guys would look at me saying, you did what? Why? Because everything that I care about is in that house. My life is in that house. My wife is in that house. My kids are in that house. My dogs are in that house. My food, my livelihood, my belongings, my greatest possessions are in that house. You better believe I am protecting that house with everything that I've got inside of me. We treat our house that way, but why don't we treat our heart that way? That when anger starts knocking at the door, hey, yo, bro, is it cool if I pull up to the crib out? Hey, is it cool if I take your joy? Hey, is it cool if I steal your peace? Hey, is it cool if I make chaos and all the comfort that you had is, is now out the window? No. I would look at you and say, you are crazy. But how often do we do that in our lives when we say, hey, anger, come on through the door. I know you don't belong to me, but it's okay. You can stay for a little while. Oh, it's okay. Jealousy, it's all right, cool. You can, you can stay on the couch. Oh, okay, gossip, yeah, yeah, it's okay. You can come in too. And these things don't even belong to us as children of God, but we allow them to consume every single part of us. Come on, I'm on an assignment today to say, you know what, devil, I'm storming the enemy's camp. I'm evicting this thing. No longer can you stay with me, but I'm taking back everything that you stole from me. Come on, is there anybody that's ready to storm the enemy's camp and say, you can't have my mind. You can't have my sanity. You can't have my peace. Anger, bitterness, offense. You got to go. <laughs> you ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here. You, you got you to gotta go. We're way too invitational when it comes to offenses. We, we are way too kind when it comes to, to anger. We, we are way too forgiving when it comes to the bitterness that we see in our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, in your anger do not sin. That's good news for somebody. Anger isn't sin. But it does lead to sin. In your anger, don't sin. But don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. In other words, take care of it. Tap your neighbor and say, you need to take care of that thing. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And then I love this. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a a foothold because if you let anger stay in the crib, you're going to give the devil a foothold. What is a foothold? A foothold is a secure position from which further progress may be made. And when you give the devil a foothold, he takes a stronghold. That's a church word that we use a lot. God, please break the strongholds off of my life. Where do strongholds originate from? They originate from footholds. You ever heard the, the phrase, uh, uh, give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your mind. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your peace. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your sanity. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your identity. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your calling, he'll steal your purpose, he will take everything from you. And I'm here to declare young people today, no longer does the devil get to steal from you. No, 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 I'm not giving him a foothold, I'm not giving him a stronghold. Today I'm breaking through. And I'm saying, sorry bro, sorry bro, you can't, you can't stay, you can't play here. So how do I deal with anger, bitterness? Offense, because Hebrews promises it will spring up, it will spring up, it will spring up. The seed will be planted. How, how, how do I manage my garden? Number one is this. I got, I got two points for you today. Two points. Number one, live selfless. Live selfless. You want to deal with your anger? 
You want to deal with your madness, your offenses, your bitterness? Live selfless. The root of anger, what is it? It's selfishness. Selfishness. What they did to me, what they said about me, how it affected me, 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 me. And don't get me wrong, maybe the way that you feel about that thing is justified by the actions and the words that happened to you. But being a believer means living like Jesus. And I'm so thankful today that Jesus didn't require an apology or any form of repayment before he got on the cross and said, hey, I'm going to die for you. No, no, no. God paid the greatest example by hanging on the cross that says in Romans chapter 5, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this way that while I was still a sinner, while I was still broken, while I was still offended, while I did not say I'm sorry, while I still had my back turned to you, Christ died for me. It's the greatest example of this word called selflessness. To live a selfless life doesn't get more selfless than this. I, I, I know I don't know what you went through. I don't know how you're feeling about it. I don't know what they said about you. I don't know what they did to you. I don't know how it affected you. But I do know a grace and forgiveness that exceeded what I could have done in return. And it's only by the grace of God. And it's only by his mercy that in spite of me, he forgave me. In spite of my situation, he forgave me. In spite of my offenses and my bitterness and all of the wrong and the yuck and the grossness that I was presented in front of God. He said, I still call you. I still choose you. I still forgive you. And I'll still die on a cross for you. This is the grace of God that in spite of me, he set me free. And maybe you're here tonight waiting for an apology. Well, when they apologize. Or maybe you're here saying, well, I don't even know the reason that they did it. Or maybe you're here and you're just like, I just want some justification before I get to that place. I hate to break it to you, but real freedom doesn't come from any of those places. Real freedom only comes from forgiveness. Forgiveness is setting the captive free only to realize that the captive was me. See, many times we think that the captive is the other person, only to realize that I was the one in bondage, that I was the one that was being held by these chains. I don't forgive for you. <laughs> I forgive so that I could be set free. I forgive so that just like Jesus set me free, I can walk in, in freedom. Let me give you some good advice today. Be generous with your forgiveness. Be generous with your forgiveness. Before they say, I'm sorry, I forgive you. Before they even realize, I forgive you. Before they even come to their senses, I forgive you. Before they try to pay you back, I forgive you. Before they try to turn the other direction, I forgive you. Before God encounters their life, hey, guess what? I forgive you. Before they have an opportunity to even have a conversation with me, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive I forgive you fast. I forgive you fast. Why? Because I don't want to be a captive. Why? Because I don't want to be in chains. I don't want to give the devil a foothold into my life that's all eventually going to turn into a struggle. No, no, no. I, for, I forgive you. I, 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 just, I just want you to forgive fast. To learn how to forgive. Do you know how to forgive fast? Like honestly, if, if you could just give a, a self-reflection, do you know how to forgive fast? Or do you know better how to hold on to your offenses? Because I want to be somebody that like Christ who's hanging on a cross before anybody even says sorry. He says, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he takes his last breath without even getting an apology. And he takes his last breath without even getting a why. And yet he hangs on the cross and he says, you know what, I don't want to leave this earth with any unforgiveness in my heart. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forgive them. When's the last day that you forgave someone fast? When's the last time that you made someone's day? 
that you went out of your way to make somebody else's day. You know what I hate? I hate rude, slow, drive through fast food workers. Can I get an amen? Right? Yeah, anybody, you ever like pull up to a McDonald's, a Wendy's, okay, a BK, I don't know what other places there are, Long John Silver's. Oh, no, never mind, never mind. <laughs> you, ever, you ever pulled up Popeye's, Chick-fil-A? No, nah, not Chick-fil-A. No, <laughs> no, nah, nah, they're always like, hey, God bless you, sir. What can I get your order? Right. My pleasure. Any Chick-fil-A workers? In, no? Okay. Oh, you work at Chick-fil-A? I used to. Oh, let's go. That's what, you still got your discount? No. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Chick-fil-A, is the, the, Chick-fil-A is the exception, right? Yeah, but you ever pulled up, and they're just, they're angry. Rah! You don't know if they just spit in your food or not. Like, that's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, anybody ever thought, like, dude, did you just spit in my food? I don't, did you drop my burger on the ground, rub it around on the greasy floor, and then put the patty? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm just venting right now. It's funny because me and my girls, we have this new tradition um, where I pick them up. This is probably my favorite thing to do as a father, my favorite thing to do as a father. We pick them up, and we take them. If they're good listeners, they're good leaders at school, and we get a good report, we'll take them to rallies. Anybody ever been to rallies before? Yeah, you've been to rallies? All right. One sister been to rallies. Ain't nobody else been to All right. We're about to rally at rallies after this, okay? Um, rallies, rallies, rallies. I'm going to be honest. It's disgusting, okay? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what I'm eating, but it's fried, okay? Fried in a whole bunch of oils and grease, all right? Um, but where we came from in Miami, they called it checkers, but it's the same thing. It's the same establishment, but they call it rallies. I think it's a cool name. Shout out rallies. Um, and we take them to rallies because they easily, hands down, have the best soft serve ice cream on the planet. It's better than Mickey D's. Okay? It is so good. They got this strawberry swirl cone. Okay? And, and this summer, you know it's hot, so I always get in the car. And I'm like, girls... Who wants some ice cream? And they're always like, ah, right? I love it. That's like my favorite part of being a dad is that right there. Who wants some ice cream? Ah, right? And so we drive up to rallies. And um, I started doing this out of reflex. Okay, because my dad used to do this when I was a kid. And I didn't even realize that my dad did this until a few days ago. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm having a flashback to my childhood. Where we would pull up to McDonald's, not rallies, but McDonald's. And he would always get his ice cream cone. And he would always treat the lady the same way. And I realized why he did it. And so what we do is we pull up to rallies. And it's usually the same young girl that's always working there. Okay. And she opens the door and I'm like, hey, I, I want three cones. Okay. And then she'll, she'll make the cones and she'll bring them out one by one. She'll make it one at a time. And every single time she makes the cone and she puts it out the window. And I'm like, girl, are you the cone master? Because that's a good cone right there. Like, yo, did you get a four-year degree in cone making? Because, girl, the swirls on that thing and the height and the depth. My Lord, you could take a picture right now, post that thing up on Instagram. It would drop a milli without a d- I'm telling you, that's a good-looking cone right there. And every single time this girl does the same, she's always like, thank you. <laughs> like this n- little nerdy white girl, right? She's like so happy. She's like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Here you go. She's like, the other day she did it, she did it, she's like, she's like, oh no, that's not even good. Like I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't try the heart, right? Like you know, she, you, oh you know, she saw me pulling up, she's like, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> she gives me the cone, right? She goes back, she makes the second cone. I'm like, girl, I didn't even know that the second cone could be better than the first cone. Right? Girl, look at the height compared to the, it. This is amazing. She's like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, little Rally's employee. Right? And she'll bring me back the third cone, and I will always, man, girl, man, I hope you make my cones every time. 
Because you killed that. For real, for real. <laughs> I was like, hey, I hope you have a great day. You're amazing. Right? It, it, it's, it's so funny. It, it's so funny. Because here's what I've learned in the last several weeks in doing this with my kids is, boy, is it fun to make somebody else's day. Not only that, but boy, is it rewarding making somebody else's day. Because when I'm generous with my words, when I'm generous with my encouragement, when I'm generous with my celebration, with my life, watch this, the third cone is always bigger and better than the first cone. <laughs> this is why it says this in Proverbs chapter 11. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others, the one who speaks well of others, the one who encourages others, the one who praises others, the one who, who, who it tries to advance others and lift others up is abundantly blessed. But those who help others are helped and curses on those who drive a hard bargain. I've got a challenge for you. Tomorrow, make someone's day. Go out of your way to make someone's day. It's easy. And watch what happens. You're going to be walking around with three ice cream cones and you're going to be like, yo, this is the best day of my life. Live selfless. Tap your neighbor and say, live selfless. The band can come back up. Number two is this. Write this down. You need to live life having a critical eye, not a critical spirit. You, you want to you you deal you want to deal with the bitterness, the offenses, the anger in your life? Live a life that has a critical eye, but not a critical spirit. What's the difference? A critical eye seeks to build up. A critical spirit seeks to tear down. And I think we have an epidemic right now of people, not with critical eyes, but with critical spirits. And their agenda is to simply tear down other people, tear down other platforms. Tear down other belief systems. You know, I love it because you go on TikTok, you go on Instagram, you turn on the news channel. What, what do you see most of? Criticism. These people being critical. Critical. I have a friend. He just started this YouTube channel preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Reaching tons of people. It's awesome. I'm so happy for him. I go on his comment section. It's like. He's a false prophet. This is false teaching. This doctrine is not right. This exegesis is false. I'm just like, bro, shut up. I go on these people's Instagram page. I'm like, dude, where are you preaching the gospel? Where are you sharing your faith? Everybody's got to be so judgy. So judgy. You ever been in an atmosphere that's like, oh, they just judging me. So judgy. That's why we try to create an atmosphere where you can belong here. Yeah. That whether you are cute or you are ugly, you can show up to church. <laughs> oh. If you're ugly, raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. <laughs> He sees you. He see, no, ain't nobody else see you because you're ugly, but God sees you. <laughs> I'm joking, bro. Some of you getting critical of that right now. <laughs> He's a pastor. He called me ugly. I, I'm leaving this church. Right? <laughs> Stop. Stop. We find criticism the most in comment sections. Where it's just like, man, I, 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 know, I know better than you. I, 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 my way is better than your way. My thoughts are better than your thoughts. My, my, my political worldview is better than yours. Just all this bickering, all this judging, all this me versus you. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, it says, don't judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others... You'll be judged and with the measure you use, 
it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank? I'm sorry. He says, why are you looking at the speck in your brother's eye when boo-boo? <laughs> you got a whole two-by-four in your eye. <laughs> like... You got a whole plank in your eye. Pay no attention to it. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's one in yours? <laughs> I love this. You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. My fear in this room today is that many of us here, we wouldn't be prepared to be judged based on the measure that we judge other people. That's my fear today. Because the Bible says, hey, if you judge others, that same measure, it will be judged to you. My fear today is that we wouldn't be prepared to be judged based on the measure that I judge other people. So I got to deal with the plank that's in my own eye. That's why I always try my hardest to see the best in people. God, I choose to see the best in them. I know they hurt me. I know it was painful. I know it was traumatic. I know it left me broken hearted. But I'm going to choose to see the best in them. Because if I don't, the worst in them only left me broken. The worst in them only left me offended. The worst in them only left me questioning, God, can you really use me, God? Can you really change this, God? Can you really heal me? So you know what, God, I'm going to choose to see the best in them. Not because a guy told me, but because that's what you choose to see in me. Anybody thankful today that God doesn't see the worst in you? Oh, my gosh. Oh, how many, like, honestly, honestly, have you ever thought about that? Anybody thankful today that God does not look at your junk and say, dang, boo-boo, that is jacked up, that is messed up, there ain't no way. But God looks at you and I, and he says, baby, I choose to see the best in you. I see the potential. We're far from it, but I see the potential. I see the dream. <laughs> Yo, that lifestyle, it does not match up. But I've got a plan. I don't see you for where you are. I see you for who you're becoming. I thank God that God doesn't look at what man looks at. God looks at the heart. And, and this is difficult. This is difficult. This is difficult. Because it's easy to see the worst in people. Because many times the worst is on the surface. And the best is underneath. That's why God says, I don't look at the surface things that man looks at. I don't look at your resume. I don't look at your faults. I don't look at your failures. I don't look at your past. No, 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 no. I choose to see the best even in you. Even in you. I choose to see the best in you. Who are you becoming? Who are you calling? Who is not answering? God, I pray for that alert in the name of Jesus. I never know how to feel about Amber Alerts. No. I never know how to feel about dust storms either. I never, I never been in one. Praise God, man. You guys get dust storm alerts? Wow. I don't even know what's going on right now. <laughs> but we choose to see the best in people. I'll wrap up with this. Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Where is the God who can compare with you? Wiping the slate clean of guilt 
turning a blind eye, a deaf ear to the past sins of your purged and precious people. You don't nurse your anger and you don't stay angry long. For mercy is your specialty. That's what you love most. And compassion is on its way to us. You'll stamp out our wrongdoing. And you will sink our sins in the bottom of the ocean. I love that. The Bible says that God will turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to your past. And he will sink your wrongdoings. And he will sink everything that makes you gross and disgusting. He will sink it into the deepest part of the ocean. That's the God that we serve. But he says, bro, you don't have to be offended. You don't have to deal with anger. Because I'm a God of mercy. There are some of you today, maybe you came in here offended. Maybe you came in here angry. Maybe you came in here with different bitterness, things that have happened in your life. I don't know what you went through. But here's what I will say. Today's a great day to lay your offenses down. To drop your anger at the foot of the cross and say, you can't live with me any longer. You can't stay here. There are some of you that you're dealing with unforgiveness from your past. Today is the day. Forgive them. Forgive them. But you don't know, I don't know what they did to you. But I know what God did for you. I don't know what they said about you. But I do know what God said about you. I don't know how you feel about that thing, but I do know how God feels about you. And today's a great day to say, you know what? I choose to forgive. 